Hey, welcome to the Fuel the Fight podcast. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Nick Berenger. Another great day, another awesome episode. Why do we have awesome episodes? Because we have awesome guests. And I am joined today with, with my good buddy and, and friend and just a legendary individual. If you talk to anybody in the, the strength and conditioning community, in the Army community, in the infantry community, uh, Donnie Bigham is, is a legend. And an uh, awesome dude. And, and Donnie, thanks so much for joining me today on the Fuel the Fight podcast. Oh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else right now, Nick. I'm on fire. I'm excited about an opportunity to throw down a little bit with you and talk a little bit about, you know, what warriors are doing on the battlefield this day in 2022. Yeah, I love it, man. I'll tell you what, I had to drink an energy drink before I came here, and it wasn't because I was tired. I was like, man, I got to at least try to match Donnie's energy. You know, I got to be up for it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. But... One of the things, uh, you know, Donnie, I, I want you to share with with the folks on here is if you can talk about your military story, because you've got a really unique one about how you kind of came into the service. Yeah, man, I started out back in 1991. You know, I was a I was a young, ambitious, uh, potential athlete. I thought I was going to go play a little bit in college, but the finances wasn't there. The scholarship money wasn't there. So I jumped in uh, into the Marine Corps and you say, well, why in the heck did you start out in the Marines? Well, uh, I had a short window of time and 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 really it just fit my schedule the best, you know. Uh, so I joined the Marines. I spent a little time there, enlisted, uh, really enjoyed my time. I got an opportunity uh, to serve with some grunts and some uh, some infantrymen, got to serve out in Okinawa, served out on Camp Pendleton out in California, and then closed my hat up there at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, uh, and then got out and, you know, had a little money for the Montgomery GI Bill. Wasn't as good as the 911 GI Bill. Uh, finished that up. I joined the National Guard during that time period. And I said, hey, because the Marines said, you know, Donnie, if you want to come back in to the Corps, you're going to have to come back and enlist it. Because this is prior to 9 11, and the cutoff then was 27, you know, to come in right off the bat as a commissioned officer. And I said, you know, I can't do that. I got to really, I want to come back in as an officer. I really want to lead soldiers and, and veterans in, in, in combat. So uh, I made the transition, you know, into the Army and, you know, end up retiring after 27 years total service. Uh, so it really, the Marine Corps set me up for success, but the Army and the path that I did uh, really just allowed me to be able to end my career in some things that I was passionate about when I first came in. And that was that was athletics, you know, and that was really getting after, you know, the warrior from that set of lens. No, that, that's and, and yeah, speaking of that, you got to you were an, an infantryman, an infantry leader. Uh, but, but you got to work down at the fitness school and, and change that culture and change that program of instruction, uh, program of instruction there. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the fitness school? What was it like when you got there, how you got there and then how you changed that POI when you looked at it? No, that's great. Uh, and I'm, you look at that It's 2013. I just finished my second command, uh, at, um, I was with um, 115 coming out of 3rd ID, a uh, combined arm battalion. I had applied twice for West Point for the kinesiology program. I, I was a, an alternate the first uh, go around. Second go around is like, oh, man, you just missed the cutoff by one person. And I'm like, man, y'all guys are killing me. I'm trying to get up there and show some guys some loves up here in this exercise science world. Uh, so what I did is I reached out to the physical fitness school because I said, I got to be able to get my hand somehow in this community to try to make a difference. Because, you know, our soldiers need to train a little bit more like professional athletes instead of what we've been doing. So I reached out uh, to the physical fitness school to try to be a strength coach there. They brought me in as an interview, gave me an interview, and they hired me. Essentially, uh, about three months later, I got I got orders. I went to physical fitness school the summer of 2014. I spent two years with them. When I first got there, the culture just was not what I thought it should have been. You know, I just didn't really see that that tactical athlete mindset. It seemed like we were still in a reactive mindset and not being proactive and really doing that. Uh, so I was just at the right time, at the right place, uh, where you know a guy named Lieutenant Colonel J.C. Glick, uh, and you probably know him from his time at the Ranger Regiment. You know, he was a he was a com commandant or a commander at the time, and he essentially just gave me the range and said, Donnie, you know, you know what we need. You got the schooling, you got the education, because I'd already completed my master's in exercise science field. And he's like, 
I want you to change. I want you to make this what it needs to be. So he essentially gave me the door, opened it up. I turned a performance center there, built that in the next year, hired the right uh, personnel, made those made those people get trained and qualified, you know, to get on the podium to teach our future, future uh, master fitness trainers. I said, you got to have TSAC. You got to have FMS 1 and 2. You got to have KFIT. You got to have USAW 1. We got to make sure you got the tools in your kit bag. And we started teaching people then at that time period, you know, how to train like a warrior in 2015. And, and that allowed me to open up to be able to nest, you know, with what West Point was doing, what Fort Eustis was doing with regards to the OPAT, the ACFT, and then obviously the H2F where we're going. No, that, that's awesome. And, and yeah, I, I remember, you know, hearing about all the changes you were making. And I was kind of following it from a distance because I was like, man, they got a, this elite power lifter who's on active duty down there making great things happen. Uh, so, so no. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize you applied to the DPE. Uh, you know, the, the, the DPE uh, missed out on that. But I tell you what, the Army got, uh, you know, probably more bang for his buck you being down there at the fitness school. So that worked out. Uh, now, you mentioned, you know, the, the OPAD, ACFT. Can you give your, you know, kind of thoughts on, on the ACFT now that we've kind of, now we've transitioned to it and it's become the test of record? Well, I can tell you, you know, and being transparent, and I can do that now, Nick, so since I'm no longer in a uniform and you're talking to, you know, retired Major uh, Donnie Begum, uh, I was not fully sold, you know, with every change that was made on the initial six events within the ACFT. But at the end of the day, I was happy that we had at least five fitness components being covered. So I was at peace with that. We had a strength, we had an anaerobic, we had a power base. You know, we had some of those core pieces that I thought was essential. You know, was it the right test? You know, we just don't know. Uh, is it the right test going forward? I really think it is with regards to the commander. We was really trying to give a commander tools to know if this soldier within their formation can execute some of these high physical demand requirements necessary for their MOS. And we really met the benchmark on that. Uh, the change from, you know, the little changes that we're starting to make, you know, I don't really think it's that critical that we go from a knee tuck, you know, to a plank, you know, because my vision on it was I, I wanted to pull up, you know, that's just where I was. I, I wanted to test the grip strength. I wanted to test the ability to move the body weight that mirrors a lot more of a high physical demand with ropes, climbing walls, climbing in windows, you know, that just kind of aligned with me more. But the plank, is it is it the right event? You know, for me personally, I don't think it is. Uh, but is it going to give us some kind of baseline gauge of some kind of core strength from an isometric standpoint? Yes, it is. Um, I think a grip test still at some point has to come back in uh, because if you've done any study or any analysis on the Warrior, the grip from what we've done at the Tactical Athletic Performance Center at Fort Benning is probably one of the biggest benchmarks that we're missing as Warriors. We are not having that baseline strength there, and we all know that kind of is going to cause some other issues in the future. No, that, that's great. Uh, gr great information, particularly with the, with the grip grip strength. Now, you know, speaking of the, the ACFT, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, you were – you like all the, the overall concept of it, but maybe not all the different, you know, task components. What do you think about right now, just recently, I think just yesterday, you know, came out. Um, now there's going to be, looks like, a push for a combat arm specific test, something more, a little more advanced uh, for, for the folks serving in the combat arms. I, I think that's, you know, perfect. I, I'm going to be honest, in every leadership position I served as an infantryman, you know, I had an additional test. I, I would essentially bring my first sergeant in, and I'd tell him, first sergeant, you own the PT test. That's yours. If they come see me, I'm probably going to process them out of the Army. I, I don't have time, you know, to be micromanaging a soldier who can't even meet some baseline oxidative and muscle endurance tests. So I always had a different event, and it, it really mirrored a lot of what the RPAT did, you know, to be able to encompass some continuous events that allowed them to move in their kit that required them to do some things that's going to be more realistic in combat. So I'm all on board with some additional tests that aligns with the combat arms because now that we've added in a gender norm to the ACFT moving forward, I think we've skewed the commander to really not give them the proper feedback that they need because if I've got a female and a male that's serving in my formation that is a combat arms unit, 
but the standards are different. I'm really got to have a balanced state there. And maybe that combat arms specific test can now give them that validity and that clarity and understanding that, hey, these are my five or six high to physical demand tests and tasks that's got to be conducted as a warrior. They're going to be able to know now if they can do those or not. No, and, and that's that's great and, and awesome. And so what I really want to, you know, the, the fun part of this question is, all right, you, you agree with the concept. Now, now what would that look like if, if uh, you were making it? So if Donnie Bigham wrote the test from a combat arms standpoint, I would have to go back and use some of the science that's already been there. You know, we've got over 50 years of data on things like a 300-yard shuttle. That was my friction point with the Army going with a 250. It's like there's no data on this. Why are we not using 300? It's already in place. Uh, so I would have something like a shuttle run, and it would be more mirrored to a 300. Uh, and then I would have, from a, a aerobic standpoint, I would have some kind of movement under our equipment and our kit, you know, that now is going to be realistic for combat. And you say, well, what does that look like? Well, it's like what we did at the Tap C. We said, you're going to put 30% of your body on, on your back. Okay, I don't care if you weigh in at, at 100 pounds or you weigh in at 250. You're going to carry 30%. And oh, by the way, you're not authorized to run. Because in combat, we don't run to the objective. Six and eight, ten clicks out. We move in a stealthy manner. We move under that load. And then when we're able to highly be able to engage that first gear ATP phosphogen energy system, now we got to be able to turn it on and it's going to be in our fighting equipment. Nine times out of ten, we're not going to do that with 100, 200 pounds of loads that we're moving in. So that's one of the other events that I would have. I would have a pull-up in it, okay? It would definitely have that. I would also incorporate, you know, a grip test. You know, whether it ends up being something as simple as a farmer's uh, carry type deal, um, or if you just use something from a scientific standpoint, say I'm gonna use a dynameter. And just like we did at the TAP C, they had to take their body weight, okay? So if you're like me and you weighed in 180 pounds, my average kit's going to weigh 60, so that's 240. I got to be able to do 120 right hand, 120 left hand. That means if I put my kit on, I can hang on a rope, I can pull myself up, I can do the functional events that I need to do. And I'm going to tell you, Nick, even at the TAP C, we had a lot of elite level soldiers that came through there. We were only at about 12% of all population that we brought through there that could meet the baseline standard. But after they went through that 12-week program, we were closer to 50% now meeting it. Uh, so those would be some of the events, you know, that I would incorporate. Just to rehash that, you'd have a pull-up, you'd have some kind of shuttle run, you would have uh, some movement under a load that would be required them to do that. You would have some kind of grip test. And then, like I said, you would have some kind of tactical specificity uh, event that would align. So if I'm with a mortar unit and I'm in a headquarters section and I'm going to be actually facilitating that, I got to do that in a transverse plane that moves a rotational of loading now for, for a, a high-vis target that I would have to do rounds on effect for that objective. So I could mirror that as a commander to pull out one or two tasks that aligns with my combat arms unit. And now I know without a shadow of doubt, if I was coaching an offensive lineman, he can do his task to a professional standard inside a controlled environment. No, that's, that's great stuff. I, I like it. So we got the 300 yard shuttle movement under body weight, grip test, body weight. What, what about, you know, one of the things I don't see, um, what about sprinting? What about a sprint? Yeah, so that sprint obviously would fall underneath either a 300-yard shuttle mm -hmm. if we was doing that without a kit. Mm -hmm. If we did it with kit, then I would have an 800-meter. That would okay. be the standard. I think the 800-meter event, you know, is the best test for a warrior because it is the hardest event. If you've ever ran that two standard, you know, and really go all or no and hit that threshold uh, from your glycolytic state into that oxidative state, I think that is one of the toughest tests out there that really could test because we know in combat how many times you're going to really sprint over 800 meters uh, continuously. You know, unless you go back and you look at 93 and you're looking at the Mogadishu mile, you know, you start looking at something like that. And I know that's an outlier, uh, but it is something you have to take in consideration because it has happened in combat. Um, aerobic wise, that would be your foot march, okay, from an oxidative state. 
or I'm still a perfect fan of three mile run. You know, I, I think the three mile, and that's why, you know, I said from the start when I started out in the Marines, they got it right. You know, that was one of the challenge I had with the ACFT staying with a two mile. That was one of my questions is, are we testing the oxidative state? Because you're really not fully testing the oxidative state for a two mile run. The Ranger just got it right with five miles. But when I say looking at the whole army, five miles might be too far of a benchmark. OK, because now you actually have to train oxidative on a more regular basis to be better at a five mile run. But a three mile run, it is that line that's going to test 60 percent oxidative, 40 percent anaerobic. OK, or glycolytic state. When you look at a two mile from a scientific standpoint, it's flip flop. 60 percent anaerobic state, 40 percent oxidative. So now that's why I ask, what are you really testing? If you're testing oxidative, you don't have the right test, okay? And if you come right after the fifth event in the ACFT, you have not even reset the heart rate. So the heart rate is still in an anaerobic state because it's not near sitting. It's, it's up and elevated. Typically, what we've seen was 20 to 30 percent, you know, obviously based on that warrior, it's going to be up 20 to 30 percent from their uh, sitting heart rate when they take off on that first leg of that two-mile run. No, that, that's great, great stuff. And, and what I love about this is, you know, this isn't like you're an ultra endurance guy that, you know, uh, you know, like our friend, uh, Matt Wilson, but, uh, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is, this is powerful. People should be listening to this. This is coming from a power lifter saying you should run farther. Like uh, that's, that's, what's uh, pretty wild about that. So, so yeah. yeah. And when you think about it, Nick, when I won the world championship in Finland, okay, I weighed in at 179 pounds. I squatted 596. I bench pressed 365 and I deadlifted 622. Post three weeks of that, I still ran a 13, like 13, 15 to my run. Wow. And people would ask me, how in the heck did you do that? And I said, because I train the specificity. I train anaerobic. It's a two mile run, two mile or 60% of anaerobic. I don't need to train at an oxidative state and train for four and five and six miles. Where we get it wrong a lot of times in the army is we train further than the test event. You should never go over 60% of whatever your test event is. So if I'm training for a five mile run, 60% of that is what? A little over three miles. I don't need to go out and run 10 miles to train for five. But that's what we've done so much in the army is we train further. And I use that example in strength training. How many times are you gonna go to the gym and you can only squat 500, you're gonna put 700 on the bar? and say, I'm going to do the reps with this now. And oh, by the way, if I don't make it, somebody's going to have to help me from sinking, you know? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I like that rule of thumb. I'll put that down, you know, 60% around of what the test is. Um, now, you know, so so talk a little bit about speed and, and speed on the battlefield. You gave, you gave a great talk at uh, Summer Strong. I was, I was just listening to before this. And, you know, you talked about, hey, if somebody comes out there on the battlefield and runs their ACFT pace or their two mile pace, they're going to get shot more, more than likely. And, and so can you talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of speed on the battlefield? And, and then the other thing is, you know, you were, uh, in a, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that occurred to you when you were deployed, you, you had that, uh, ambush, uh, scenario in Afghanistan and talk about kind of how your, you know, your, your physicality, your training, you know, strength wise, not just mentally, how that helped you in that that scenario? Oh, most definitely, Nick. Let me go back and peel the onion back a little bit to 2009. Yeah. You know, we're back in um, Afghanistan. You know, I'm with uh, Seventh Group. Uh, I was part of an embedded transition team before we come up with these SFABs. I was kind of doing that back then uh, during that kind of gray area. And you know, we're we've operated in that sector. I, I was stationed up in Chamkani at at Bob Chamkani. It was about two kilometers. Uh, west of the border of Pakistan, and, and we kind of managed the AMP, the ABP, and the ANA that operated in that sector. Well, we had spent about two days down in Johnny Kale. It was approximately about 15 kilometers south of where our FOB was, uh, and we had done some shures and done some other dialogue with some key leaders there, and we're getting ready to roll back. And it's unfortunate, you know, very familiar with that terrain, it's just not conducive, you know, when you're rolling MACVs and things of that nature back and you got a really tight choke point 
and, and you got a lot of uh, mountains to traverse through. As we're coming back, they got an L ambush set up on us pretty good uh, that morning as we're in route back, and we're on about a probably about a 30% grade coming up the hill. At the crest of that hill is where they had the L ambush set up where we was getting ready to turn to a dog leg left. Uh, and my lead vehicle kind of took some contact from a PKM. It was approximately 35, 40 meters in the wood line. They had it tear cased up on us, stacked up with some RPGs above it uh, that were kind of falling in on the kill box on us. Uh, I was second in the order of movement. We had approximately 35 packs uh, and about nine to 10 VIX uh, that was with us. So my lead vehicle essentially, you know, got kind of caught up in that PKM being that close, kind of caught us up pretty good. He really couldn't kind of get uh, dominant fire on that position. So our battle drill is is to dismount on the non-contact side, you know, so we can reconsolidate and, and be able to kind of, you know, conduct some uh, a hasty ambush back on that uh, opposing force. Well, I had to dismount on the contact side because I'm, I'm on the assistant driver's side, you know. My Turk sitting behind me, you know, I opened the door and dismounted. You know, we take direct contact from about 10 meters uh, along the high ground of the road, and they're running trench lines inside those pine trees uh, that's kind of just embedded in there. And you got guys kind of popping up and down, you know, thinking you got a larger force, but in reality, those little skinnies, you know, they can run around pretty quick in and out of there with their flip flops on and their AK 47. So we returned fire and I bound up and we. We, we reconsolidate, but when you think about the opportunity of getting engaged from about 10 to 15 meters, the most important piece is to have physical dominance, obviously to get gain superiority of fire. And well, how do you do that? It comes with maneuver and it comes with establishing base of fire. So we had some base of fire to, to allow some of our guys to be able to maneuver, get out of the kill box so that we now can get in a position to move on that opposing threat. Well, when you think about the speed and audacity it takes, well, you know as well as I do, it's a mental piece involved, and it becomes in a, into a position of where you've been there before, you feel comfortable, and you trust your people left and right, and you know you got an ability to engage. But when that threat is imposing on you, you know as well as I do, it goes back to your training. And as a commander and a leader of that group, my training was hard for the guys. You know, they, I wasn't their friend. You know, there's a lot of people didn't like me. You know, still to this day, I might not have as many friends as I probably should have. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that's what's most important. And we trained specificity, and that was speed. You know, we did a lot of speed work, uh, 10, 20, 30, and 40-meter type shuttles because you know in combat you're not going to sprint for three or 400 meters to find that next cover and concealed position. And the way I looked at it is if I can run 10 meters a tenth of a second faster, if I can run 22 tenths of a second faster, it's just going to allow that enemy less opportunity to engage that threat. So that was one of the main reasons why we emphasized that, because I knew if I could bound somebody to the ridge line, to that edge of that crest where that ambush was, they was covered. They would have to throw a grenade on top of us. They can now maneuver to another position to get that dominant position, and that is going to allow us to have the ability to win that fight. And just in that situation, we were we actually did, you know, have a soldier uh, lose a little bit of eyesight from some shatter off uh, off the turret. We had some glass that busted. When you got a PKM firing that close, you know, there's going to be some stuff that's going to go through, some shrapnel and things of that nature. Uh, but other than that, everybody else was good to go because we was able to maneuver and fire on that threat before they could get set again. And I, that goes back to our speed training. We've done so much speed work that really put us in a driver's seat, I felt like. No, and I, and I, you know, I appreciate you sharing that story, Donnie, and, and I'm hoping all the young soldiers and leaders listening to this are taking notes right there. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think if, if somebody uh, had not been as, as fast as you, quick thinking as you, getting out on the contact side like that, putting yourself right there in the, in the middle of that firefight, uh, you know, your, your ability to, to take over that situation and to dominate that situation is, is why, you know, all your soldiers got out of it alive. So, uh, no, thanks so yeah, much for sharing Yeah, that's part of it, that. Nick, but I definitely, I definitely don't take the credit for that. I, I, um, I take my soldiers as one that did all that. You know, all I did was just get out and try to help set the tone and set the pace. But they had trained so hard and trained so well that they were able to get in a position and really take over. And then I could step back 
and be that leader that could control all that firepower I had in front of me. Oh yeah. Well, I expected you to, of course, you know, you're a humble guy, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say it. They they were lucky to have you there that day. Um, so, you know, you, you continue to do work. You're retired now, but you're still doing work uh, for the tactical athlete community. And, and one of those things is you've been, I know you've been hard at work uh, developing this uh, tactical athlete program. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and you know, the benefits of it and, and how you developed it? Most definitely. I've been working on that, Nick, for about 15 months. You know, I, I got a call from uh, Bert Soren as the owner president of uh, Soren and X. He reached out to me and he said, is there any unfinished business that you didn't really get to do? you know, in reference to the tactical athlete. And I really told him, I said, yeah, you know, I really worked hard to get those performance centers up and running, to get the right staff in there, to get their models in place. I said, but I really wanted to have some kind of app, something for the warrior, because there's going to be a gap that's still got to be bridged for a while, because it's going to take us about 10 years with this longevity model to get strength coaching, get performance experts within the soldiers that are in the conventional army. So with that, I said, what I would like to do is be able to get some video content, get the right uh, prescription put together, and give them some options. So we essentially build out uh, three tiers. Uh, and within those three tiers, it kind of mirrors what we do in our, our fighting situation. You know, we, we look at tier three is more of our generic piece. Uh, we look at our tier two, it kind of is a hybrid. And then we have our tier one for our elite level athletes. So the tier three, it's going to give them five or six training sessions a week minimal equipment i built all this out with like rucksacks and bands and some simple kettlebells and dumbbells so the cost is really low from that aspect but it covers all aspects so if you look at a five-day training model it's going to give you two days of strength slash power it's going to give you two days of anaerobic it's going to really get after that gate in your speed work it's going to give you a day of pure oxidative uh, aerobic training and then it's going to also be able to throw in the active recoveries throughout the week based on your rate of perceived exertion with your fatigue level because that's the biggest thing that the army misses they think it's all or nothing nothing in every training scenario and we know as warriors and as athletes we can't train at 110 percent every day we have to have days where we dial it back where we work on some other things so we're more more well-rounded uh, and that's one of the biggest things that is encompassing that app. So that app's going to give them the pre stuff they need. It's going to give them the uh, specific execution within it. And it's going to really give them the recovery pieces that lines up with that. And as I stated in the beginning, it's all minimal equipment. Okay. Until you get to a tier one, I've got tier one laid out like if you had an H2F or you had a performance center, you've got all these tools uh, available that you can now access so you can get the full potential uh, as as long as you apply that within that app. It gives you all the touch points. So pre-workout, you get the ability to go in and start to reflect on your sleep. You get the ability to reflect on your nutrition and how that's going. So it starts to compass that so it is individualized because we all know it looks different from each athlete where they are if, are they coming off an injury? Are they in, getting ready to go into a deployment? Or are they in a reset mode? It allows you to be able to do that. And as we continue to build out within this tactical app, it's then going to be MOS based. Okay. So if I go in and go, you know, I'm in combat arms and, and my job is to be part of an uh, uh, armor tank uh, platform, it's going to allow me to be able to put that in. So when you go to your tactical workout that week, it will give you some exercises that will align with that. So prime example, if I want to be better as a, uh, an infantryman and I'm in part of a ranger unit, if I understand it, my, one of my high physical demand is a clear room. So you're going to be doing the circuit. It's going to have a lot of zero to three seconds of movements. So it mirrors what you're going to be doing in the room and allow you to now get carryover. So it now becomes tactical specificity so that you can get better at that. For example, if I'm number three in the, in the order of movement and clearing a room, I'm going to breach that room. So if I'm doing that with a simple sledgehammer, I've taken a big tire, I've set up a, a tree stump, and I'm now able to hit the bottom hinge of a door, the top hinge of a door, and the door knob in the middle. That's part of that circuit that's built within it. So now I'm, as a breacher, going to get better at that specific task. Wow. No, Donnie, I mean, that, 
the level of detail from your experience, you know, both as a, as a strength coach and then as a tactical athlete that you can apply, that you're thinking, you know, down to the breacher, uh, man, that, that's phenomenal. That, that's awesome. And uh, a lot of tactical athletes are going to benefit from it. Where, where would they find this, this program? Well, right now we're finishing up the landing site. Uh, so it's going to be through Sorna Next. So I, I definitely could share that with you, Nick. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing out the landing page. I'm going to be doing studies. Uh, we've got uh, U.S. University of South Carolina ROTC program and four junior ROTC high schools within Columbia, South Carolina. That's going to be jumping on the first groups because remember I said the tier three is designed almost like for that basic trainee or for that delayed entry. Because I was at delayed entry Marine when I joined and they, they gave me a sheet of paper and said, hey, Donnie, go out and run a mile two times a week, do some push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups. And that was pretty much all I had. So we're, I built that tier three for that to help bridge that gap. So we're going to be running with them. But I'll definitely send you the link out. We're hopefully have it out by 15 July. The landing page will be up and running. They'll be able to go there. They'll be able to get some instruction, some insight from me. They'll have the links there to be able to jump on because we just we just finished our beta testing with about 100 people that we ran through the test and made some small changes to the program based on that feedback. So I'm definitely excited about it. No, and that's the other thing about, you know, you, you're, you're also, uh, you know, you got the, the tactical side, you got the strength coach, but you also, you're, you're like a scientist, you know, as a, as a fellow scientist, I can say that because, yeah, I mean, how many uh, tactical training programs before they release it to anybody or going to train anybody, would they actually run 100 people through it to see what it looks like and then go, okay, now let's, you know, see how it's going to work in the real world. It's not all notional. Uh, so I respect that a lot. Thank you so much, Nick. And that's, you know, I told you, I know if you don't recall, you know, I'm starting my PhD, uh, University of South Carolina. So I'll be kicking that off in August and I'm, uh, I've, I've got a big vision, you know, you probably know, I don't, I don't plan small things. Uh, my big vision is to really change how the ROTC, you know, trains their uh, future leaders. Uh, and I, I'm really going to go after it from a standpoint of um, trying to pull in every ROTC uh, within the United States and come after that program. No, that's, that's awesome. And, and there's going to be a lot of future leaders that are going to benefit uh, from your knowledge. That, that's exciting. What other resources do you recommend for tact uh, tactical athletes maybe listening to this, getting into training? Well, first and foremost, you know, there's one gold standard out there, and that's the NSCA Tactical Strength and Conditioning Facilitator. You know, they've been in place since 2012. I've been nested with them. They've grown a lot uh, across the tactical population. That's one area you need to go to. And then secondly, what I'm doing right now is I'm, uh, I'm in the infancy of building a curriculum uh, for certification with uh, Kabuki. Uh, so we're, pos we're potentially going to be writing it out for the next six months. Uh, so over the next six months, you're going to be able to see that we're going to offer, you know, potentially three different courses. We're going to start off with a base course uh, that's probably going to be like a weekend uh, seminar that we're going to really, you know, dive deep into this tactical specificity. So we're looking at that warrior task and battle drill and breaking it down. So those coaches that come, they know now how to give you know, this commander, the tools necessary so that their unit can all raise their benchmark to where their high physical demand requirements are. So that's one of the second pieces. The third piece I want to talk to you about is, again, to go back to the NSCA and the TSAC-F. And I'm actually one of the coaches and leaders there uh, with the practitioner course. So they offer a 32-hour course, you know, for people to be able to go through that. And I tell you, if you request myself, I've got a counterpart, a buddy of mine, Riley Ross, uh, he, he was coaching at seventh group. Uh, he's a former MMA fighter. And then he was a head strength coach for um, o Ohio State University wrestling team uh, for many years. He partners with me and we go around and do those 32 hour courses throughout the year. So definitely that's three areas I'd say to be out on the lookout, you know, for those warriors that really want to get after it, help bridge the gap. Okay. Until they can get that team on board that can really help them within their organization. No, that, that's great, and I got those down. I'll put those in the show note, and I'm even thinking, I'm like, we got to figure out how to get you to San Antonio. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to be out in San Antonio, you know, in August. I speak, I'll speak. i be speaking at the TSAC-F there. I'm going to be doing some stuff on biomechanical analysis. So I'll be in y'all's footprint about the third week of August. Yep, yep. 
uh, I had Jason Swallow on uh, just uh, yeah, man, a couple weeks I heard ago. He's- yeah. I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're, you know, we're telling people. So, people listen to this here in San Antonio. Donnie's going to be down here. You do not want to miss that talk. And, uh, yeah, we'll have to get you on uh, post and show you around a little bit. Um, where can folks find you? What, what, how should they follow, follow you and, and learn more about you? Well, obviously, they'll need to go to one time powerlifting. And anybody asks me, you know, what is, what, what is one time powerlifting? That's, that's my, uh, that's my name. That's my business I've had now since about 2014. And, you know, as everybody that knows anything about me knows that I love Christ and I follow him. And when it says one time, that's what it means. You know, God sacrificed one time for us all. I put power lifting on the back because, you know, I'm a two-time world champion and I, I like to move a few pounds on the platform. Uh, but, yeah, they can find me on social media uh, with one-time power lifting. They can find me on YouTube with one-time power lifting. My data's a little bit behind on YouTube. I'm going to be updating some stuff in the future on there. Uh, and then they can also, you know, find me. Uh, via my email, uh, whether it's through Kabuki Strength, Donnie Bigham uh, at Kabuki Strength, or whether it's uh, my old email, CPT Bigham uh, at yahoo.com. Okay, and I'll put that all in the, the, the show notes. And and moving a little weight, because I do got to hit on this, because this just blows my mind about you, is like, what is what is your squat? What, what, do, you, what do you squat at what body weight? Can you just tell the crowd? So my, my world record is uh, 601. Woo! And uh, I weighed in 179, uh, and I was 46 years old when I did that. Uh, so if anybody out there thinks, you know, you can't hit a PR in your mid-40s, you're wrong. Uh, so uh, you can do it if you if you do it by the science. If you have a good nutrition plan and, and you have a good recovery plan, you can smoke that. My deadlift, best ever deadlift on the platform is uh, 629. Um, and my best bench press on the platform is uh, 381, uh, and that's a pause, you know, and it's all drug tested, weighed in, you know, two hours prior to that event, um, and you have to travel across the water, you know, to go place like Sweden and South Africa and Finland and compete at that level. It's uh, I'm looking to actually, Nick, uh, to actually get back on the platform next year and try to see if I can maybe – you know, shake a little feathers in the in the fifty year old bracket because I I turned fifty this just past May. Wow, wow, no, I, I look forward to that. No, I I, I knew you, you did over six hundred, and I just at your body weight, and then like you said, at forty six years old and drug tested. That's always important too. Uh, caveat in any any strength field, you know, not yeah. not judging people, but I'm just saying, you know, there's a difference. Uh, so so no, and, and and the fact you can still run a you know what a little over a 13 minute two mile run a lot of times so impressive impressive any closing thoughts for uh for the group the biggest thing i would say you know for everybody is we're still in the infancy you know be patient you know trust the system the army right now i really think is investing in the warrior uh understand that there's things in place really reach out to people within their leadership uh to help find solutions uh, don't go out of pocket and, and go buy your own personal trainer or something like that. There's solutions out there, even if it is bridging the gap with something like my tactical app. Um, it's going to be way less cost and more uh, scientifically sound because it's coming through my set of lens. And and remember, just like Nick says all the time, you know, you can have the best training program in the world, but if you don't have the proper nutrition and, and you don't sleep adequately, you're not going to ever get the results you ever strive to get. No, hey, Donnie, thanks for that. And, uh, hey, th- thanks so much for jumping on here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, brother. I can't wait to see you in person in August. We'll have to get together. And, uh, yeah, ha- have a great day, and we might have to do this again. Sounds great, man. I appreciate it, Nick. Take care. All right, take care, brother. Bye-bye.